merciful, the grantor of mercy, all praise and glory belongs to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Indeed, Allah is deserving of the best of thanks and the most beautiful of praises. Welcome and thank you for inviting me on Living Muslim. I'm your brother Muhammad al shinawi and I wish very quickly to talk about the most important topic a Muslim should have at the center of his attention, loving Allah properly. When you look into the lives of the early Muslims, it's very obvious that their love for Allah was truly pure and truly intense and truly unconditional. And that is because it was built on sound foundations. And that's why no matter how exhausting life got, how frightening events became, how frustrating their circumstances were, they were able to ride through this world safely because they were so absorbed in loving Allah and they were enslaved to adoring Him, and they were willing to sacrifice anything to please Him, and that's why they were content and happy with whatever may have come from Him. And this is not a trivial issue. This is the subject for the Muslim. This is the core and essence of being a Muslim. Islam, to surrender your heart before your body. And even the surrendering that we do with our limbs, prayer, fasting, the likes, all of that is to get our hearts. It is absolutely necessary because it is the vehicle that the end which comes from it is getting your heart to recognize Allah and journey to Him with balance of fear and hope, of course. But what spearheads that journey is your loving of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah made it the hallmark of faith, the hallmark of iman. And He said, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ as for the believers, they are more intense in their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So is our love for Allah proper? Is our love for Allah truly unconditional? If you were to ask yourself in a moment of honesty or ask a Muslim, do you love Allah? Why? They'll say, of course, Allah has given me so much. Is that the only reason you love Him? This is not proper love for Allah because if He does not give you, will you no longer love Him? And many people are like that. As soon as a blessing of this world is pulled out from under them, automatically their relationship with Allah changes. It gets phased as opposed to the early generations we just spoke of. Immediately their thoughts about Allah begin to transform into something sour. Immediately their devotion to Allah begins to dwindle. And so we wish to talk about what it means to properly love Allah, or should we say the proper foundations upon which our love for Allah should be built so it could reach those high beautiful levels that makes our life enjoyable and makes us a betterment to ourselves and those around us and makes whatever happened to us, even if it be death itself, simply an upgrade in our relationship with Allah. Building that foundation correctly, upon it love will be built, can be said to be built on four major cornerstones. The first of them, is deeply reflecting on the names and attributes of Allah. The second of them is accustoming your heart to become attached to the hereafter, the final abode. The third is understanding, realizing, recognizing the blessing of being guided, being guided to belief, being guided to faith. And the fourth of them is recognizing how much Allah has blessed you in the past, regardless of the current. As for the first, loving Allah is built upon, above anything else, reflecting on His names and His attributes. This is what the early Muslims did. They hibernated, and this is the short answer for how to love Allah correctly. They hibernated on the Qur'an. They looked deeply into the book of Allah, listened carefully to their Creator as He was speaking. They gave their undivided attention to the most truthful of speakers as He was addressing them from above His throne and they found therein described a magnificent God that you cannot help find out about except that you love Him because Allah created you that way to adore perfection and He is the epitome, the definition of perfection. So perfect, so unique. 
Ar-Rahman, which means loosely translated, the unimaginably merciful. The most mercy you can imagine is that of a mother. And that is the ceiling of your imagination. And that's why the Prophet wasallam said to us that Allah is more merciful with his slaves than a mother is with her child. They read about Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahim is the grantor of mercy. Grants it in places you expect, places you may never expect, places you may never be able to notice. And that's, by the way, our answer. Slight side point to those that say, how can God be merciful and there's evil in the world? Allah is Ar-Rahim. Of the manifestations of Him being Ar-Rahim, the grantor of mercy, mercy is that He places mercy in everything. We don't believe that evil exists in the absolute sense because our Lord, the creator and maker of the worlds, He refuses to allow something to exist in His universe that is purely harmful. There is no benefit in it. There is no mercy embedded within it. And so He is Ar-Rahim. They discovered that Allah is Ash-Shakur, the most appreciating. Who can appreciate you the way Allah does? If you were to smile on someone's face and He comes to you the next day and says, here is a brand new, Mercedes or BMW or the likes. You'll think this is a prank or a joke and someone's recording somewhere. Allah gives you for the small acts that you do, reward for eternity, every single day, without end, more reward than you can imagine. A kind word is charity. Removing a thorn from the road is charity. You smiling in your brother's face is charity. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said to us that when we do a good deed, Allah has informed that He'll give you 10 for it, up to 700 fold for it, and even beyond that if He so wishes. And if my slave does a bad deed, I'll write it down as one bad deed. And in another narration, أو أغفر, or I may overlook it altogether. Allah is so appreciating that one tear from you, He is willing to wipe out all of your past, regardless of what that may be of crimes. Allah is so appreciating that He accepts our good deeds even though they're flawed. Forget multiplying for them, they're flawed to begin with. The greatest of our acts are prayer and we end our prayer by saying Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Oh Allah, forgive me for the flaws. It reminds me of Abu Yazid al-Bistami, Rahimahullah, he used to say, our good deeds because of our humanness are so flawed that that alone should be enough to stop us from even thinking about disobedience. How in the world could I defy him? Even my good deeds are not perfect. But that's who he is. He is a shakur, the most appreciating. He'll never forget it for you and reward you for it in ways that are beyond measure. And then they read about Allah who is a shakur. They read about Allah who is a shakur and then al-wadud, the most loving, so loving. He has no need for you whatsoever. Yet he becomes happy when you repent to him. How in the world does that happen? That's who He is. So you love Allah for who He is, regardless of what He does for you, regardless of what He has given you, regardless of your responsibility to Him before all that, regardless of there being a paradise or a hellfire, simply who He is, subhanahu wa ta'ala, His very essence, His very nature. Can you imagine that Allah Azza wa Jal initiates the conversation with you, the king of the cosmos, and he says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ My slaves ask you about me, O Muhammad, if they do, when they do, tell them I am near. I am definitely near. Allah Azza wa Jal says, tell them, O Muhammad, O my slaves who have crossed every limit in wronging themselves. You're still my slaves. And you've crossed all the limits against yourselves. Don't worry, you haven't harmed me. Look at the beauty, how delicately he addresses his slaves. Do not despair in the mercy of Allah. No matter what you do, the verse says, just make sure you don't despair in me. So Allah the Most High, they discovered Him in this book and they reflected on His names and His attributes. This was the bedrock. This was the foundation to the greatest door of your faith, the greatest door of Iman. And Iman is interchangeable with loving Allah. Enter through that door. Don't treat it casually and everything else will be details. The second we said, is attaching your heart with the hereafter because that is the true reward for your deeds. The hereafter, when a person arrives there, he'll realize, Alhamdulillah, for the good times I spent in dunya, he didn't hold it against me, if he's a believer only. And this will lead to the third, appreciating guidance. And also when you arrive in the hereafter, you'll realize all the harm you went through, Alhamdulillah, I wouldn't have liked it any other way. Even the things he kept away from me. 
And so we move on to the third point very quickly. Of course, they overlap and they're interrelated. Appreciating guidance, that that is the true blessing. Every other blessing that you have in your life or may acquire or wish for, it is relative. It could be a benefit for you and it could harm you. Money, wealth, children, lifespan, whatever it may be. It could benefit, could harm. The only pure blessing that is purely good is that of guidance. And that's why you notice in Al-Fatiha that you say, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Guide us to the straight path, the path of those that you've blessed. That's the truest blessing. Once you have that, everything else dwindles. That's why Shurayh al-Qadi, rahimahullah, the great judge of Islam in the time of Umar ibn Khattab, he used to say that whenever I go through a catastrophe, a hardship in my life, a blessing is stripped from me, a tragedy, I thank Allah four times for it. I thank Allah that it wasn't bigger than it already is. It could have been worse. And I thank Allah the Most High for granting me patience in enduring it. And I thank Allah for reminding me to say, Inna lillahu wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. As the believer says in catastrophe, we belong to Allah and to Him is our return. And I thank Allah it was not in my religion. It didn't cost me my guidance. That is the truest blessing. And the fourth of them is that you think about and deeply what Allah has given you in the past regardless of the current. Regardless of your current circumstances, think about eyesight. And when you think about blessings, always make sure you don't think about them in passing because shaitan loves that. Allah Azza wa says that shaitan said, he recorded for us his words to warn us. I will come to them from in front and behind and on their right and on their left. ثُمَّ لَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ And you're going to find most of them are not grateful. He wishes to keep you distracted, keep you busy, come one attack after another. They will not be grateful, oh Allah. So don't say, oh man, alhamdulillah, I have eyesight. Say, what if I really didn't have eyesight? Close your eyes for a second, right? That will bring the desired effect, inshaAllah. And then when you think about it, think about all the times you've had eyesight and realize that you're not entitled to this. What reason do I get upset when I, something is removed of me? Whatever I've received in the past, it's a blessing. A blessing by definition means I didn't earn it. Meaning all I've had in the past was a bonus to begin with. So it's extra, it's unpaid for. So for what reason should that jeopardize my relationship with Allah? If only we would have been fair with Allah Azza wa Jal. You know Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says further about these blessings. He says, and if a person were just equitable, fair with his Lord, the way he, he judges his Lord. A very sour statement, painful, but it's healthy in the long run. He says, if the slave were just fair with his Lord, he would realize that Allah's favor over him in the things he takes away from him is actually greater than his favors in the things he gives him. Meaning he only deprived you to grant you. He only took from you so that he could give you something better. If you would have just given up the right to judge and thanked for what has passed and realized you're not entitled to this, the doors of wisdom would have been opened up for you. To realize Allah knows I don't. As the Quran teaches us to say, perhaps you hate something and it's better for you. Perhaps you love something and it's worse for you. وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And Allah knows and you do not know. Once you get past, is there a wisdom in this? No, for sure there's a wisdom, right? And Allah knows it. And even if He shows me a bit of it, I can't know all of it. So Allah knows and I don't, then Allah will begin to show you the wisdom and the blessing in what has passed and what is current. So reflect on all of that. And these should be a good foundation for you, inshallah, to erect your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and journey to Him safely. You will be able to take the qadr of Allah, whatever is destined to come your way, in stride. And you will take the sharia of Allah, all that is you are indebted with and liable for of the religion, in stride. And this world will be enjoyable. And your stay beneath the soil will be enjoyable. And the day that you stand in front of Allah will be the best of your days. May Allah grant us a life upon loving Him and a death upon certainty in Him. And may Allah resurrect us with the one who taught us how to love Him, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.